I'm here with James Willard from NHS England. Uh, James, where are we now with digital mental health interventions? Are we at the point now where we've actually got effective, safe interventions that we can use in the NHS? So we have uh, some digital interventions that are uh, that we have the evidence to demonstrate they are safe and effective, and I think. Um, David in his talk really focused on the idea of therapist assisted digital te interventions and I think that's where we're focusing at the moment because that's where the body of evidence is. I think beyond that there are groups of technologies that are up and coming so virtual reality the evidence for that is certainly growing and I think that's been helped by the kind of unit cost of VR headsets coming down so it actually gets cheaper to do that research. I think the further stuff out in terms of artificial intelligence I think looks promising. I think it's it's in that kind of zone of anxiety for quite a lot of people and I think that's where the structures and frameworks that colleagues in NHSX are coming up with in terms of the code of conduct, code of conduct to really help us kind of manage that anxiety, stay thoughtful and logical in how we're approaching that in order to kind of uh, you know, manage the hype, uh, but not kind of uh, lose 10 years in taking benefit taking benefit from those technologies. I remember talking to you, it must have been about five years ago at the MindTech conference, about the general response that we get to digital from psychologists and psychotherapists, which is, you know, you're not going to replace me with a robot. Do we still have that response, or has that kind of matured a little bit? I think that we're getting much more sophisticated in our understanding of digital and I think if my definition of digital and I think it's other people's definition of digital but the digital I uh, hold on to is the cultures and practices of the internet age and I guess for me increasingly digital mental health is the clinical cultures and practices of the internet age so it's that kind of blending of, um, of those two kind of domains if you like in cultures and practice and I guess what we're seeing is that there's increasing technology that augments the experience both for the therapist and the patient. I mean, I talked about in the panel about how I think robots, if you like, robots are going to replace some of the administrative tasks, the logistics tasks around getting people in the right place at the right time. But I think technology is going to just only augment the kind of therapeutic process. And I think that's going to be like that for some time to come. And then also, <clears throat> from the patient perspective, seems to be this narrative, which is that I don't want digital, I want proper therapy. And David Clark said in the panel discussion earlier, um, well, of course patients don't want digital. Uh, maybe I was misinterpreting that, I'm not sure. But what's your view of how the public now are viewing digital interventions? So I think we... Uh, the, the wider cultural kind of movement is, is much more around personalization and choice and really being uh, the center of attention of a, of a kind of, um, uh, what's the word, a shopping experience if you like. So we're used to the emails from Amazon telling us our delivery driver is called uh, John and he's 25 minutes away and you know he'll be with you and then we get updates and so forth. So I think there's an expectation in wider society of those kind of experiences um, which are going to filter through into um, IAPT and other mental health services. So I think um, th those expectations are going to have to be met in some way in healthcare services and I talked about robots taking over logistics but I think that could be an area where we could improve uh, or, or, or technology could readily improve our customer experience. Um, I think in terms of but that's then going to translate into choice. So I already have uh, families bringing the sleep data from their child's wearable into my clinic to show me. that I can't stop that from happening and I've got to learn to deal with it. And I think that's what's going to happen is we're going to have to stay adaptive and flexible. When actually people bring that technology to us, we're going to have to be able to feel confident and, and, and be able to respond to that. So. I think it's going to be a gradual process where it just becomes more normal for that technology to be in the room, used in some fashion to augment, but I, I, I also think there will always be people who want to choose a high fidelity, if you like, face-to-face -face experience, you know, where it's, there's, there's, a, there's a high touch experience, as they say, in terms of um, those communication skills. I think there are others who would be quite happy to chat away to their therapist forever on an internet-based platform. 
So as by far the most digitally enabled child psychiatrist I know, <clears throat> you're way above all the others I know, um, how do you respond when parents come with the sleep data of their child? Um, in a very excited way, if I'm honest, um, <laughs> because um, it's, it's great. I mean, we've developed a digital platform for our, for our families that allows them to track sleep data and um, the, uh, keep the diary about their child's behaviour. When they come proactively and in a an very activated way, bring that data using a wearable device, I'm thinking, how do I plug that into the platform? Because they've got access to our platform as well, and that's sort of frustrating. But actually, it's really helpful. I think what you've got to do is obviously there's a lot of concern about the accuracy of these uh, wearables at times and is it always reflecting. I think it's about taking the kind of broad overview approach. If you're looking for patterns for significant change in that data over time, I think that's helpful. It's about the variability, if you like, rather than the actual, well, on that night, the device says they got seven hours and 19 minutes sleep, of which two hours was deep sleep. I think we've got to take that up with a pinch of salt. Let's look at the bigger picture, and that's my approach to it. We've spoken quite a bit this morning about the lack of skills in the workforce. What do you think needs to be done to make sure that the people who are actually delivering this stuff are able to? So, um, I think uh, one of the approaches that I'm interested in trying, and in fact I've just got some health innovation uh, uh, network funding for this, is, is high fidelity simulation. So NASA um, trying uh, out their people and their technology in this place called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, which is a large swimming pool, um, and then they kind of send their people and tech up into space because they know it's going to work. I think we've really got to hang on to that idea that giving people those kind of high fidelity simulation experiences where they can they can play with the technology in a safe way that's not going to reflect on their appraisal at the end of the year or their performance data on the dashboard, you know, but actually gives them an experience that allows them to get it wrong, but also to get it right and work out how to get it right. So I think that's a fundamental key to me. I think that, you know, that's, that's keeping people in that zone of proximal development, if you like, is really important. And, and that takes courage to some extent. It takes a little bit of investment. It's about taking people away from the front line long enough that they can have that experience without fretting about the pay, you know, what else they've got to go back and do. So it's a bit about safeguarding that experience enough that people can be in a safe place to learn. So that's a kind of simulation lab, so in the same way that we train mental health professionals currently in yeah. simulating, doing that with, with digital interventions. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, whether it's trying out virtual reality or perhaps a, a piece of technology that allows you to remote monitor vital signs or an app on a mobile device that you might work through as a patient with a, with a patient on a ward or in the clinic. It's, it's, it's helping us find out what's the best combination of those technologies in the, space that, in the spaces that we really work in rather than some office in Silicon Valley. Thanks a lot for taking time to speak to us.